Welcome. I'm John Scott, director of the School of Art and Art History. Thanks for coming today. And it's certainly a pleasure for me to introduce Stephen Hall and Chris McVoy, uh, who've joined us here today uh, for a number of uh, interesting events. Um, our relationship in, in the School of Art and Art History with uh, Stephen and with Chris started way back in the 19, late 1990s. And we've been really working with them on and off all of these years so that we in the school tend to look at them more or less as our in-house go-to architects. And we feel that there aren't many academic units who can make that glorious claim. Uh, and also I would add that uh, through most of that period we've also uh, been working with their uh, longtime Iowa partner, Rod Cruzy. Where are you, Rod? There you are. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to work uh, with Rod as, as well. I think one of the reasons that we enjoy working with Stephen Hall Architects in the School of Art and Art History is because they are artists. Uh, and our idea was that these projects, whether it be Art Building West or the new Visual Arts Building, should be themselves work of leading edge contemporary art. And that's how Stephen, uh, Stephen, if you remember way back uh, then in the 90s, uh, Dean Maxson was there and you came and you presented work that was so persuasive as, as art that after you left the room and we were all there together, Linda said to us, well, there's nothing to talk about, is there? We know who's going to get, get this position. So uh, thanks, thanks for that. And um, we feel that to have a building that is a work of art is part of the program of what we do in the School of Art and Art History because it, it is a work that will inspire our, our students and our faculty when they enter the building to various creative uh, endeavors. And in any case, that's how we got Art Building West, and that's how uh, we, now we are getting the new Visual uh, Arts Building. We think that uh, Stephen and Chris have given us in uh, the Visual Arts Building uh, truly a, a work of 21st century art. Now, Stephen will first speak about what he calls the architecture of art, and then Chris will come up and talk to us about the place of the Visual Arts Building in that larger context. Stephen. Thank you, John. It's really great to be back here. And I, I was reflecting also this morning about 1998, uh, uh, when we had that first interview, and then Dorothy Johnson is here. I'm so happy to see Dorothy, who was very, very supportive in those first days. That was from 1998 to 2006, eight years for the opening of this building. And now we're from January 22nd, 2010 to 2006 and a half years. And, uh, you know, Rod cruzy has been with us the whole time, Rod Lenhertz. It's an amazing, almost kind of like a family endeavor here. But for me, <clears throat> It's really important because I've never had the, and I'll, I'll get into that when I get to the building, I've never had the challenge of trying to add a new building with a very ambitious program, larger than the first one, and, and trying to find the architecture. And, you know, you'll see it in the, in the talk. But this morning I was thinking, you know, these buildings are really different and they're very exciting because one is planar the one that we're in, and one is volumetric, the one that we're opening today. And I was thinking back to my first year studio that I rewrote in Columbia University, which was to really take the beginning of architecture as lines, planes, and volumes. So that means there's one more building, and it has to be linear, otherwise we don't get the, it doesn't get completed. <clears throat> so let's see, how does this work here? All right, so what I wanted to do was take one point which is really expressed in the new building and that is making a kind of social condenser space, a place where 
the, the people that pass through there understand or get excited about the art. And we were just talking about today that some people were passing through in lab coats and stopping and looking at the gallery space. And this is something that we've been doing for a while. All the way back, the first building that, in a way, launched Stephen Hall Architects was the winning of the competition of Chiasma. And I'm just going to go through a series of buildings and focus on this, this one idea of the social condenser space. The original competition, this idea of intertwining, but the original competition program had a, 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 a lobby space that was sort of one-fifth the size of what we, and we finally realized in the building. And that becomes a kind of amazing place of activity, of meeting. There's this watercolors from the, from the competition. And I'm going back there in November. The building is very alive. And what's interesting is that space becomes a kind of, let's say, magnet. And uh, in, at great openings, you can see this sort of energy at all levels in that space. And that's at the other end of the space, in the upstairs gallery. Natural light, of course, is also something I'm really excited about this building. We were I just in there this morning going through all those spaces, and nobody had the lights on. There were different people working in different places, but no lights needed. This was a, <clears throat> the Pratt School of Architecture where the building, the centerpiece burned down and we had the charge to make a new entrance and connect the two buildings left and right, 1860 and 1890. <clears throat> and so the idea was basically the floor plates from the two buildings were different sizes to bring them through to the center and make a kind of zipper space that would be an activating space at the ground level and slicing all the way up through this. It's a very small addition. And you can see that the front court also became a place of activity. But you see that sort of zipper space. And what's nice is you go in, and then there's an auditorium. You go down, and that space opens up to be a crit, crit space for the architecture students. And then as you move through the building vertically, you have views out at the end of the, the ramps that connect the zipper space, and people can see each other as they work in the studios all the way down through the building. The Nelson Atkins Museum, likewise, has these five lenses, and one of them is basically a condenser, the sort of large entrance to the building. This was a competition um, which I had a very good client. We had a good client. Um, we broke the rules. You were supposed to build on the south, north side of the building. And uh, we went down into the landscape, completely going off the site. And uh, there was a number of international competitors, Tatawando and others, who built right up against the building. And we said, that's the wrong thing to do. You should keep this building all facades restored. And when I, and I said the new building would be the, you know, in contrast to the old, the stone and the feather, the heavy and the light. And when we went up to the jury, I said, you know, we had the courage to break all your rules because it says in the carved stone facade from 1933, the soul has greater need of the ideal than of the real. And we won the competition and realized this building, which also has a kind of social space outside. That's all open to the public in and out of the lenses, and that's that great space at the entrance. And also the wonderful courtyard outside that changes in the seasons, not unlike the way the water would freeze here in the pond. So you have light coming down to the levels below. Another school of art, the Reed Building at Glasgow School of Art. This was a competition with how many? It was like a thousand applications. And Chris came to me and said, shall we try for this? It's Glasgow, it's Macintosh, we should, we should give it a try. So we put our, you know, you know, it was one of those things where you have to go through a round. First you s submit, was it a portfolio? No, we had to do some sketches, Three right? Boards, yeah. Three boards? Yeah. So we did and we prevailed and we got into the final five or whatever it was and uh, we, we won. And maybe that was the most difficult project we ever did so far. So far. The Kennedy Center is, might, might be more difficult. <laughs> I think we had like, I don't know, like 70 presentations to various, you know, Glasgow uh, has one saint of an architect, and that's Macintosh. 
and I loved his work. Uh, but we're building a building next across the street from Macintosh, which is like there. You see an aerial view. You see the Macintosh building to the left, and our building to the right. So we we had this idea of really working with natural light and making that be the core of the building, the sort of what we call driven voids of light. And they, these, I don't have a pointer here, I'll just walk over here. These, these, these concrete tubes, these concrete, 15 meters, 15, 20 feet wide, they bring the light down, they let the air come out, it's all naturally ventilated, and they're also the structure that holds up the floor plates. So it's all about this condition of light and making a kind of simple building in, in contrast to Macintosh's. So we were very excited about the simplicity. And actually, it does do a, sim a similar thing in, in terms of uh, contrast. And that is, the Macintosh building was thin bones, steel and wood, and thick skin, stone. So our building is thick bones, all exposed concrete, and thin skin which is a kind of recycled green glass. So this was a sort of also a way of making a, a, a clear relation to the building. So this was something that they talked about is abrasive collisions through the entire school, a browsing circuit, a kind of circuit of connections which connect every department in the school. And those would pass through and intersect these driven voids of light. So that, that, was, right, that was right in the beginning, the, the concept. You can see this notion of driven voids of light. And then the realization, and, and I think everybody's really excited with the school. It opened two years ago. Um, those volumes become also uh, activators for activities. This is the main cafeteria space. But you, they've, they became places where uh, little concerts go on, where certain student art projects go on. A certain thing that's not in the program that brings a kind of social condenser space to the program. And this is at the opening, which I was, I think I have this little video, which I really love. They had, their, they had written a very special piece of music. Let's see if I can get this to play. The enthusiasm of the students in Glasgow is amazing, you know, and I think the building uh, becomes a kind of catalyst. And uh, they gave me the kind of original score of this art, art, what is it for? So it was a wonderful piece written for, for the opening. A project that we're, we're, we're building right now at Princeton University, which is basically the entrance to the campus. Um, from New York City. If you come on the dinky train to Princeton, you'll pass through this building. And uh, Peter Lewis, bless his soul, was the, was the main uh, donor for the beginning of this project. And it was Shirley Tigman's intention that the arts is being, in a way, underexposed at Princeton. And uh, so to create a balance for the humanities and the arts, that this place would be a place where you would experience the arts as you walk into the building as you walk into the campus. You pass through from the dinky train through this large space. And the program was for dance, music, literature, poetry, all of the arts. So we had this sort of sub-concept of a thing within a thing for the dance studios, the notion of embedded for the literature and gallery section, and the notion of suspended for the music building. So the idea of a collective, which is the big music plaque practice room, which is down below. And this was very difficult to get through the university. But this was, a big, this was one of the big pieces of the program. This had to be as big as the stage in the, in the, in the, in the concert hall that they could practice, and then individual practice rooms. And I said they should be suspended on rods, so they would be acoustically separated, and they would have a kind of presence, making the building something special. But the whole thing is pulled together over a forum. This forum, this forum.
platform connects all three buildings. You, you enter the complex from below. And this piece is not in the program. So this idea of a social condenser that condenses all three of these buildings, that's something that we brought to the, to the table and we had to fight for it for like five years because they kept wanting to somehow take it out, but they couldn't because it's like what holds everything together. And if you want to have the, the plaza, you have to have the forum because that's connecting the... So anyway, actually, what's really interesting about what you call staying with it against all odds is, I won't mention any names, but the people who were resisting this are now uh, you know, at other universities and not there anymore. And <laughs> So now everybody loves what we're doing and everybody's super happy and all the naysayers are gone and it's amazing. You just stay in there long enough and don't give up and somehow it comes true. So I'm very excited. This is, this is going, I think it's going to be what, another seven months? We're just putting, the, everywhere you see this foil is insulation. There's a leche stone, which is like four inches thick, comes from leche from a quarry. Uh, that was opened by the Romans 2,000 years ago. That's a kind of buff stone that goes over. And that's wherever the concrete structure is where the Lecce stone goes. And here's this water pond. And look at the size of these skylights. They're huge. They're glass, laminated glass, like square like that. Because of the technology of laminated glass now that we can do that. No mullions. And so the forum, which is this huge space, wasn't in the program. This will be a, a social condenser space. And my idea is that now... People are working on their laptops. They're talking, they're working on their iPhones. When they're, when they're working, they, they want to have like a casual place, an interacting place, and there's a cafe there. But that connects all of these arts. And then, to give it kind of a very special quality, those big skylights are, in, are below the water. This is just a construction shot. But what happens is this water then throws this incredible light in patterns as the wind blows on the floor in big squares all over this forum space. So I think it's going to be a spectacular addition to Princeton. And along the edges are the routes into the adjacent buildings. This goes into the dance. I call this the dancing stair. And it goes twirling up into next to the dance practice rooms. But that social condenser space is the main idea. And there you see the, the music building where you can, they're, they're, they don't have their wood sheathing on them, but you can see the rods that are suspended in these practice rooms. The main uh, orchestral practice is down below. When you see it, as you walk in from the dinky train, you look into the orchestral practice. So that's going to be spectacular when they're practicing there. But the building is so thin, you can see the blue sky right through it. The, these uh, two glass walls are tensioned uh, raw, uh, tension cable glass, so there's no mullions of just suspended. So that's a very, and the concrete frame then holds everything up. And that will get, everywhere there's concrete will get three inches of, or four inches of a leche stone. So that's, that's a kind of, and now here, when I'm thinking about here, I'm thinking about what an exciting thing it is to come back to this building and think about all the, I mean, all the stories, you know, about how we, you know, realize this. I remember, um, in the competition, I guess it was the interview, and Dorothy asked me, you know, what, you know, what can you, uh, what would you conclude with? And I said, well, I would just say that the the the, the Harrison Obramowitz 1968 edition covered up the insignia in the original building, Ars Longa Vita Brevis Est. Don't do that mistake again. Art is long, life is brief. So, but this project really was one also of a long. Yeah, it was a long process of design. It got certain delays, and it's, it was really a, a joy to work on. And I remember the ideas, the ideas of planar, the idea that the building would be built out of exposed steel, because we could do that. It's, it's uh, short enough to meet the code. You can expose these structural elements, which will allow you a certain robustness for an art school, but also a certain vocabulary. And that was something early on. and. Uh, exciting. And then at a certain point, we were looking at the schemes, and I realized that it looked like Picasso's 1912 guitar. And after that, everybody you know, made that reference, and that was, the, that was the, let's say, the myth origin point of the building. But that didn't really come first. It came sort of in between in the, in the process. 
and saving the, 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 the pond and, and Ken levering the library out, that had to do with the fact that there's a big utility line in the street here. Quite a large plus of utility line. So there's a, there's a pragmatic reasoning in this project. And um, you know, Dick Gibson wanted me to put the building over here. And I said, but that could be an art <coughs> quadrangle in the future, someday in the future. And now today, we can see that it can be a wonderful garden for sculpture. And to be fair, he, he said, all right, Stephen, let's show me what you can do. And then I think he came to New York, and he saw what we were trying to do, and he liked it, and let us go ahead. So that was a, a, a key, key moment and a key, key point in the process. And it's been, you know, I have all these magazines. Global Architecture Magazine has it on the cover. Many different magazines in Spain, Europe, Tokyo <coughs> have published it. There's Richard Archwager's sitting figure, bless his soul, great artist. And the stair, which is also a social condenser of sorts, where people meet, and the Brancusi-inspired studios. So then we come to 2010, January 22nd, where we had a scheme I think we had a sketch scheme. It was not really a competition, but everybody comes to the interview these days with a sketch scheme, right? They already have something. But the site was like five times bigger. It went all the way back. And then when we prevailed, we re they, they told us the site would be much smaller, and I think it just kept shrinking and changing size. But also, I couldn't, I was having a big, big struggle with this. And, uh, these, all schemes, all of these schemes have complete plans and sections and areas. They're all to the same area that we were required to build this building. So there you could see the struggle of an architect. <laughs> and Kenneth, I invited everybody to come to the studio. Let's look at that again. It's so painful. Oh, wait. <laughs> Let's look at it once more. Can we, can we look at it once yeah. more? Every one of these schemes has plans and sections. Rache knows she had to draw everything, right? Over and over and over. My, my studio is being, they're crying, you know, stop. You know, stop <laughs> on something. Do something, just stop. And then also, uh, if you get all this extra advice, like Kenneth Frampton, it should be Core 10, the original building's Core 10, this should be Core 10 too. They should be a university uh, relationship. I said, well, I don't think so, you know. Anyway. I'm very happy that we settled on the right solution. And uh, that was a kind of key moment where I realized that this building could be volumetric and not planar, and therefore it would be, in a way, a contrasting building to the, to the original planar building. And that sort of, that was a key moment. This is 331.11. And we realized that because it's a very big square floor plate that these cuts, these vertical porosity cuts of light would really relieve it as, as, it, as you can see and, and experience it. And then we would express the sort of s simplicity of what I call the laminar section, that is the different floor plates slide a little bit at the courts, at the cuts and create these courts. So that was a kind of key moment, but, but for an architect you can imagine we could have gone through any one of those other schemes and proceeded but I said, it's not right yet, it's not right yet, it's not right yet. And I think also the university and people were patient with us and let us have the time, right? I don't remember exactly, did they give us more time or we just had more time? Yeah, we had, they, as the site changed, we had more time. I see. So, and then one of the key ideas, of course, we're keeping this quadrangle, but one, then one of the key ideas that emerged was the route through the building would be a route of, of of, of, let's say, social condenser route for other people coming through the arts building, diagonally moving, and being able to experience the space and, and, and the galleries, and you know, you know, be inspired while just passing through the building. And I think that, that, was, a key, that was a key moment as well. And that those multiple centers of light would be places that would activate the different floor plates. So, we try to locate some circulation next to them in different ways. You know, you have the wonderful big court, which is the main social condenser, but these small uh, centers of light also become a kind of social condenser 
ideas in themselves where people you come out of your studio you can't have you're not having an idea you have writer's block you sit out there you talk to someone they they suggest a book you you go back you have an idea so this idea of interaction is very you know like people are not just locked away in their individual studios so that was yeah that was four five eleven multiple centers of light and as we moved you know this was a kind of let's say, inspirational moment, but as we developed the building, we realized that, that this really needed to move, this needed to move to the center and make that connection through so that we could make that circulation connection also be one of these big feelings of the light coming down. So it's a very large square floor plate, but, but it has this, this possibility. Now, Chris McVoy, I think it, we've been working together for 22 years. And after you work together for 22 years with someone, you don't even have to talk to the, that person. We, you know, you just move forward. You make a decision. You make it together. You keep going. You know, you know what's right and what's wrong. And and, and it's amazing. I I mean, I I, I feel so fortunate. I, I I architecture is a deep collaboration. You know, we have Riche here. We have Chris is going to name all the BNI Rod Cruzy. You know, this is a the difficulty is. You have to, everybody has to be working together for the same, you know, sort of same, you know, cause. And uh, that's something you can't do alone. And I think to take a little watercolor and turn it into this beautiful building, I think Chris is going to tell how, how that was done. I'm going to leave. Thanks, Stephen, uh, and thanks, John, for the, for the intro. Stephen will be back at the end. Um, I like this photo because we're, we're often looking upside down at things, so this is a, a great uh, intro. Uh, to summarize the concepts that Stephen outlined, and I think it's because of the strength of the concepts that keeps the whole team moving forward in a focused way. Um, they, the first is the interconnection, the fact that the arts today are more, more and more interconnected, collaborations between different media and connected to the university, to other departments. That was a driving idea in the building. How could the building be an instrument for that? Stephen spoke about the campus space shaping of that and the stairs being also social spaces, as it is in this building with this great stair here, um, multiple centers of light, and then the material resonance and ecological innovation. And the, that dialogue Stephen spoke of, that the, new build, that the new building is conceived in direct relationship to this building. This building is planar. The new building is volumetric. This building extends out into the landscape. The new building light carves into it. This building is steel. That building, the new building is concrete. This building is clad in weathering red steel. That building is clad in complementary blue-green rind zinc. So the two create their relationship through difference and shaping that space. And the, you see here how the light is what's carving this building, these light courts. And they're shifted at the floors as a kind of expression of the loft, horizontal loft-like floors meeting the vertical. And from the interior, the light pushes in as volume, volumes of light um, that engage all the studios and bring light deep uh, into the building. The center one, the seventh uh, at the center that S Stephen was talking about in his sketch that we shifted to be part of this campus route from the east through um, becomes the main forum. And uh, Stephen was talking about working with Princeton and the challenge of getting that forum there. And the interesting thing here is when we did, got the brief for this building in 1998, there was already a forum in the brief. We did not, in this case, you know, we were in complete alignment with the university and the school. In fact, it was called the Interdisciplinary Community Forum, which then became that space out there. So the, the acknowledgement and the desire on the school's part for this kind of social space um, was a great, it was an inspiration to us. And the plan is actually very simple. The space feels complex and unfolds as you move through it. Uh, but you see the six light courts around the perimeter that are carved out and the play between the curving carving of the light courts 
and the simple orthogonal organization of all the programs creates a dynamic where the light is the most, the light volumes are the, the most organic and sculptural qualities. And the center form, number one there, um, creates the, the, the center space for all the movement, but it's the white space here. So all the white space between the program, between the gray space, that's the social space. And it's always connecting between the inner forum and the exterior courts. So you're always drawn towards the light as you move through the building. And you can see the yellow areas then become social spaces, informal spaces for the kind of interaction, working on your laptop, informal meetings that are so important to teaching and, and working on art today. And that's a view, as you guys know the building well, that the light is often drawing you through the building. I'll speak a little bit about the making of the building. Um, it's been three years, and one of the things that was exciting is to make that building in concrete um, in relation to this one in steel, that we could expose the structure, that the structure would shape the space. So you, all the studios have these concrete walls. And it's a, a hybrid structure where the walls are sometimes acting as beams, sometimes take, carrying the load, but in, in collaboration with columns. And it was um, developed using, with Bureau Happold and Structural Engineering Associates, using this advanced software called SAP, and um, that's one of the floor plates. And the red areas are the, the areas where you have the most deflection, which is a problem. So the, this program is great for architects, because all you have to know is that the red area is the problem, and that you've <laughs> got to do something about it. So we, were, we went through, I don't know, how many iterations, probably 20 iterations of this, to be able to adjust the structure in the columns. The columns are the darker blue, and you know, ended up with this. And we had no red, so we were happy. Um, but that, the integration of the structure and the space in, this, in, in the new building is, I think, one of the best we've accomplished. The other innovation is all the floor slabs are made using what's called bubble deck, or these plastic bubbles that you see here that are in the slabs, and that reduces the weight of the concrete by about 35%, makes it much more efficient, um, and then where you, don't, where you need beams or column drops, you just leave the bubbles out. And that allows us to span uh, 32 feet with only 12 inches. Very efficient and, and makes the building lightweight. And then we integrated radiant tubes into the structure. So the whole, all the floors are the heating and the cooling of the building. And that combination of the bubble deck and the radiant floors have not been done before. Uh, so we had a great innovation uh, in that. And that's why the ductwork that you see in the building is mostly for the art exhaust and those kinds of aspects. So in construction, the building had all these tubes, which are the heating and the cooling, that then get coordinated into the slab. And uh, I'm not sure we'll have time this afternoon, so I wanted to take this opportunity to thank uh, at least some of the key people. As Stephen said, uh, making a building like this is collaboration, and um, some of the people here today were key to that. Roche Espinoza, project architect, Philippe Tawada, who worked on the design in our office. Uh, <coughs> Rod Cruzy and his team, Dana and uh, Kayla, and especially uh, Tom Hilton, and especially John Sloan. Uh, for the university, obviously Rod Leonard's has been key, and I think Rod and John Belden Scott and Dorothy, uh, and Steve McGuire, uh, there, there's the reason two of our best buildings are right here is because of them. And um, that kind of collaboration is rare, so we're thankful for that. And the, the engineers, I'll just mention, uh, design engineers Amy Infeld and her crew, and the structural engineers um, Kelly Gippel and Bureau Happold. It, it was a great team, also the contractors. Uh, Myron did a great job. The building's incredibly well built. And Steve Haney and Raymond Dix from Myron um, they actually liked the challenges. You know, the building was very challenging to build. They enjoyed it. They, they took it on and found ways to do it in innovative ways. That's, so it's really uh, the result of that team that the building has turned out so well. Uh, for example, the Myron Construction built all the formwork for the concrete in the computer first. Every, every piece of wood that's needed to pour the concrete was put in the computer so they could calculate it all, cut it all, get the curves, and know it was precise. Uh, and that's how we get this fluid 
geometry with the concrete and Shaping space with concrete is a great joy because you can make these volumes because of the fluidity of the material uh, and it's taking all the, the forces and the gravity, but it's also able to, to be fluid in space. Um, and this is, you know, as I said, the concrete is also the shaping the space and the exterior structure. This is actually a beam. This wall of the Fibonacci square windows is a beam that spans on the, on the third floor. And all those windows, they're all designed in the Fibonacci sequence. So they're three foot by three foot, five foot by five foot, and eight foot by eight foot. And they're spaced in those same intervals. But we space them from the inside out. So this is a section through the exterior wall from the rooms within. So we calibrated the ideal natural light for every space, every studio from the inside using the Fibonacci as a kind of musical score. And that, that creates the exterior rhythm of the squares and they, then they mix with the volumetric light of the light courts. The light courts um, from Stephen's sketch, which is very free, but has a kind of intuitive act of carving that, of course, we wanted to capture when we realized the building. Th those things, those sketches, that's not arbitrary, even though it might be done quickly. That has a kind of, the act, the creative act of carving then needs to be respected when you do the working drawing. So, the, this is an example of the plan of one of the light courts and how it shifts. This is with BNIM, of course, um, really uh, working out all these geometries that then the, all that glass was made in a warehouse nearby in pieces first to get the precision of the, of the geometry um, and, so, and also to be done in a kind of pristine environment. So they've spent months making all those pieces um, it was actually a pretty nice installation. It was almost like an art in installation in the factory with these curving volumes. And then they were craned into place. And as soon as they went in, you could see the play of a curving cut making a shadow on a curving wall. And that light becomes a material through this. This is the U-plank that we also used in this building. But in this case, it has an insulation, a special insulation that makes it a little bit more thick, thickly translucent. The exterior screen uh, was something, it's on the two south elevations. So the north elevations are punched windows in the zinc skin. The south, east and southwest have this screen over it to modulate the light into the interior. But it also does many other things for us. It abstracts the scale and emphasizes the sculptural carving of the, of the light courts. And uh, Stephen had an idea going from the plan and those shapes of the light courts to make the pattern. So the pattern actually comes and references the light courts in the building. Um, and Roche spent um, probably four months drawing those into thousands of panels. <laughs> I would go over to Roche's desk, it's like, oh God, you're still working on those panels. You know, we thought that it would be easy, it would just be repetitive, no. Um, so, and then it's tested, rigorously tested, in this case in Wisconsin, taken through storms with these machines to make sure the whole assembly is working. But this was an exciting moment because we could see the phenomena of the screen and how it was playing with the light and being installed. This is, um, I don't know, maybe eight months ago, something. Uh, and you could begin now to see the, the feeling and the character of the building. And as Mike Metz in his talk said last night, that the screen, the building from a distance, appeared, the screen appears to be solid in the day but it's, it's actually just a mesh floating over what he called the essence of the building. And that it's this interesting play between things that appear one thing but are another and have an essence that can stimulate, um, stimulate your, your, your mind as you move through the building. And it has this play of shadow casting on, you know, shadow casting on screen, on shadow, this play of light that gives it a depth So something that's very abstract from a distance becomes very fine gr finely grained detailed up close with all this variation that thankfully Roche drew, it's there. And from the inside, uh, this image is a little washed out, but it creates this dappled light, not unlike light through tree leaves. Um, 
and it gets embedded in the Ocalux insulation. This is the first we've been wanting to use this special kind of capillane insulation for a long time, which doesn't have filter. It's just tubes, and um, which helps the insulation, helps channel the light in, and the shadows from the screen are embedded in that. And that's it, you know, and it's opaque, and then as, as night comes, you begin to see the pattern of the squares behind to the point that they really take over, and the light courts, which were negatives during the day, become positives at night. And there's a blurring that happens through that screen of the squares. The studios are obviously equally important to the social space, and there was a lot of effort put into the, the choreography of the light, in this case a painting studio, so it's mostly a solid wall, um, and uh, the skylight, top light, and then some side light that's diffuse and direct, uh, this balance of different kinds of light. And the fact that the light is always changing in the studios, as Stephen said, they, you don't have to turn the lights on, but the fact that there's always this change uh, is something that stimulates uh, you know, our senses. And Mike, Mike Metz last night was talking about how because of that change, light is energy you know, fundamentally, and because of this changing energy in the space, you're aware of change and the making of art, the, make, the creative act of making art, is a kind of optimistic one where you can enact change. So there's this relationship between the changing environment and what, and, and the creative act. Um, and these, you know, on the north side, you get these frame views of the landscape in the studio. And the mix of diffuse and, and uh, direct light. Sorry, I'm in these photos trying to be a professor, but we, there weren't any students around when we were photographing the building. Um, the printmaking studio, which has probably the most complex light, several volumes, light courts, as well as skylight. And the views in from the social spaces as you move through the building, these frames of the different activities. So if you're a printmaker, you may see someone doing textile, or you may see the, you know, someone painting. And the individual studios, all of them are different. Every painting studio is different because of the rhythm of the windows. So there's a kind of individuation. And the, you know, we enjoyed making frame views back to this building, that these two buildings are in dialogue. And it, Stephen, the topic of Stephen's talk um, is key in an art school, especially the social space, the space of informal working. And you know, this building was one of the buildings where we developed it further because of this form, that the form that's here. So uh, we, I think we've taken it even further in the new building, where there's constant engagement between students and students, students and faculty, and the, the space has become these open volumes. I heard, um, when I was here yesterday, I heard there was a dance class, or the dance instructor came in to practice a piece, I think maybe we'll see later. And she said, do you mind if I just teach my class in the forum today, that this is our studio? And of course the school said, yeah, sure, great. So they were actually, there were all these dancers in the space, and it wasn't a performance, they were just rehearsing, they were, it was a class. So the integration of arts, that you can make a space that provokes, provokes that kind of interdisciplinary action is, is ideal. We, we really want, you know, all of us want the, the students to take charge, take control of the space, do things in the space. Um, there was a, uh, the director of this Glasgow School of Art um, said she retired when we finished the building and they asked her, well, what did you learn in your 14 years as director? And she said, irreverence. She said, I learned from the students that irreverence is important because irreverence leads to openness, a kind of questioning. And this building, is we made it solid, we made it flexible, and now you can start to see the art going into it, which is great. And we're very happy that uh, Mike Metz parked his stone motorcycles next to our front door, uh, and that's another engagement of art in art, around art. And I'll hand it back to Stephen now for the, the rest. Talk about a long time. Uh, I'm just going to show th three things. You know, 
an architect is egotistically involved in the recent work, so I'm going to show quickly three uh, new things. But uh, talk about long involvement. Mike Metz and I have been working together since 1980. Where's Mike? Is Mike here? 1980. How many years is that? 36 years we've been working together? Which is a long, and in fact, the first, one of my first progressive architecture awards was the Metz House. And uh, the model, the concrete model, is now in the Museum of Modern Art permanent collection. So it never got built, but it's in the Museum of Modern Art. <laughs> if it actually got built, it might be torn down, but now it's safe. <laughs> so uh, I wish, we have a new project at Franklin and Marshall College. The great president, Daniel Porterfield, wants to uh, enhance the arts. Um, there's an existing kind of blocky building here, which is just a brick, black wall brick. delicate campus. Uh, I was just thinking, I hope Myron Construction would come and build this. <laughs> Is there anybody from Myron Construction here? Not, not. Anyway, because they did such a great job and they were so wonderful on, on, on this building. But I just briefly show this because it has this idea of the social space at the center of it. And Franklin and Marshall is named, by, named in honor of Marshall, uh, the Justice, and Ben Franklin, who flew his kite into the trees or up into the electricity zone. And my first sketch was crazy. I mean, I just make this kind of crazy sketch. And uh, it's interesting that that sketch came back in another form. And that was, we went through several schemes. But it, this actually, we went cr quite rapidly to this idea because the trees, the trees at Franklin and Marshall are older than some of the buildings there. Some of them are like four feet trunks and 200 years old, and it's an amazing. So I took, you can see the radius of the trees, and instead of a brick box, make the inflection of the, the tree radii, make a pavilion that lifts up and floats. And, one, and this is also an arts building. It's 33,000 square feet. It's very small. It's smaller than any of these arts buildings. But at the center of the uh, idea, they had, in the old brick building, they have just a corridor, and there's no place to pin up. So at the center of the idea, the studios would give on to this commons, this idea of a social connection to the commons space. And uh, that's been approved. And we're now in design development, I guess, right? Schematic. In fact, I heard that we got some bids and they were on budget, yeah. right? So anyway, I'm not going to show the whole thing. I just, it's very exciting. And it's a building about the arts, open to, to the view below, floating in the clouds like a kite. And here's a little project that began in our studio, I believe, in research all the time and, and working in drawings and models. We called it Explorations of In. Um, we wrote a little manifesto and, and we just, and actually tonight at um, City Ballet in New York, the, the theater piece that we did with Jessica Lang Dance, um, Tesseracts of Time, will play again. Hopefully the New York Times will be there so you'll be able to read about it. Um, I think it's, it's going to be traveling around. It's going to go to Seattle. It's going to go to Dallas, various places. So we did a dance piece. But this was a little manifesto. To study architecture freed from the purely objective. From origins of architecture, we explore in. In, all space is sacred space. The architecture of in dominates space via space. Intrinsic in is an elemental force of sensual beauty. In is useless, but in the future will be used. Purpose finds in. The thing containing is not the thing contained. And we, we worked on these thoughts in a series of models. And this is, went on for a year. And then we decided to try to make a building out of these ideas. And this is sort of the steps. There are four spheres that we're intersecting. We're looking at the inside. We do the inversion of those four spheres. Then we insert a tesseract to support the space, the inversion with the tesseract, and suddenly then we decide we're going to make a guest house, a 900 square foot guest house. Yeah. It's kind of crazy, you know, starting that way, but we did it. And, uh, and then there was a kind of uh, hunter's shack on the property, and we decided to, to, to turn that into a gallery because the house is so small it needed other space. So one piece is black and the other piece is white, and we had this fabulous contractor, but you can see it's really about these spherical intersections. And uh, we found a, 
uh, Javier Gomez, a fabulous contractor that built everything in wood, all handmade. At first, we were going to try to do CNC fabrication of these elements, but we found out the cost was prohibitive. And besides, he said, I can do this by hand, and I would love to build it by hand. So this is a, a, something that starts in the computer. It starts with an abstract idea and realized by hand, by, by man, out of a labor of love, 900 square feet. And lastly, a project in, in New York City, believe it or not, we're kind of never build in New York City, but we do. Well, this is our third thing, all, of, all, all about social space. And it's a tiny library in Queens. And the idea was to, the site was large enough, you could have built it as a one-story library. Of course, it would have been a lot cheaper. But I said, let's go vertical. Let's make the site a, a reading garden, a park, and let's go vertical so you have views of Manhattan. And let's, and that, those Manhattan views become like cutouts. And let's make a balance between the digital and the book. Everybody knows that libraries are under, you know, let's say, a change. And so everywhere you see bookcases, there are computer desks on the other side of them. So they're, they're actually balanced. And the section of the building goes up so that as you work, walk perpendicular to the city, you get these views of Manhattan. And that was basically, that's all open space inside the building, that, that big central space that I just showed you. That's open all the way to the top. This, this whole space, so this is the digital book balance, but, oh, and then there's the, the children's library, and each one of those pieces you can see carved in the building, and it goes all the way up. So that becomes a kind of tiny building, but, and, and it's also, a, Similar to this building, and that is it's a concrete frame. There are no columns because it's only 40 feet wide. And those cuts are what you, know, what you were seeing on the inside. That's being expressed on the outside. Now, this building is a tiny little public library. It's surrounded by these gigantic condominiums that are growing like, I don't know, like weeds in Manhattan all over. And what's really exciting, OK, that's that big social condenser space. But what's really exciting this, I just was out at the, the uh, what do you call, topping out ceremony, and there was a man, a congressman by the name of Jimmy Van Brenner, who supported this building and is so proud of it, and he's bringing people to it, and everybody really is excited about it because it has this little character um, uh, in the middle of all these skyscrapers, and the views back to Manhattan are going to be amazing. So this will be a public space. This will be where architecture, as a kind of intense, sculptural work draws, uh, I think, the community into it. There's a big reading deck on top. You see Manhattan in the distance. And I don't know if this shows up very well, but you can see standing in all of these in a sort of $2 million apartment uh, condominiums all around, there's, there's continuing to grow. This little figure is a public space, and uh, I'm very excited about it. There's Lou Kahn's the FDR Memorial, and this is from the United Nations, is over here, and that's that little piece of, let's say, intense architecture about social space. So I think that's what I have. Are we going to have questions afterwards? Yeah. Some questions? Anybody? I look into this watercolor pad. You know, I, I start every day uh, making these drawings. And I really believe in the, the sort of, let's say, the, the dreamlike state of the mind that you can connect to things that you're not really sure of. In other words, if you study something, all the practical aspects, the program, the side, and everything, but then you just forget all that. And you, you make drawings, you, you connect to your intuition. And uh, there's a new book by Eric Kandel, which I really recommend for this, for this topic. See, I just, I just gave a lecture at the Salk Institute in La Jolla. It's called Reductionism in Art and Brain Science. It's an amazing book by Eric Kandel, K-A-N-D-E-L. And it really talks about top-down 
processing of the brain and bottom-up processing of the brain. And it really explains neurologically the creative process. And he uses abstraction. He says there's an important thing about abstract art is it doesn't give you all the answers. It makes your brain work top down, not bottom up, to add the other dimensions that you need to complete the, the thought of what it is. And so therefore, the beholder becomes part of the process. It's a great book. I, I mean, I just finished reading it on the plane on the way here last night. And I woke up this morning and I thought, maybe I should just give that lecture I gave in San Diego and talk about Eric Kandel. And that lecture was titled, Architecture Activating the Brain. And I think, well, I think we're in a moment that's very interesting, and that is science, uh, and, 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 and especially brain science, uh, uh, neurobiological discoveries due to, you know, sort of scannings and how we can see that certain synapses of the brains are working in different ways that we never knew before can inspire art, can be connected to thinking about art in new ways right now. I really recommend that. It's a little book. And he really knows about art. He talks about Mark Rothko in detail, James Terrell in detail, Fred Sandback in detail, de Kooning in detail. He, he, he really understands. He is a, he's a, is a genius man. He teaches at Columbia University, Nobel laureate, Eric Kandel, and he understands that linkage that I think is really, you know, it's, a, it's at the core of the creative process. Euphoria. It's, it's fantastic. It's amazing. I mean, I was up, I was walking for one hour this morning. I want to be by myself, right? I mean, it's like, and it's really beautiful. It's a beautiful, and also to come to this building, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend the rest of the day just kind of walking back and forth because there are pieces and parts that I know that you can't see. I mean, there are certain moments in the building that I, I wonder, did this work, you know? And it did work, you know? And, uh, well, not because of me, because of Chris, but and all the whole team. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful. But when you're working on it, we work so deeply with models and drawings that, in a, in a certain way, it's already there in my head. So I'm not surprised. I'm actually surprised how good this building is, because as you saw in my lecture, I had real doubts that I we couldn't make a building as good as this one. And then I thought, oh, my career will be over because they'll say, yeah, he was good in, you know, back then, but now look at what he's doing, you know? But that didn't happen. But I mean, it's, it's a scary moment. If you do one really good building, if you have to build next door to it, it's got to be better than the one you did before or else you kind of washed up. They'll go to the next guy, right? I mean, I don't know. That was running around in my mind. So I'm, I'm very, very happy today, and this is a great day to see this. Dorothy. That's kind of the core, that was kind of the core of this idea of the social condenser space when we, when we, when we were thinking about how we're going to connect this building vertically, I made this watercolor which was, you couldn't really read it as a stair, it was like a whirl of plates, planar plates going up, almost like a small tornado of plates going up. And I thought that, that could be, and then there could be wider and, and longer, and you wouldn't really, you wouldn't perceive it as a stair. It's something that you're walking on that you could go up. And with Guy Nordson's help, we, we realized that on rods and things. And I, I'm, I, very, I still love it. I think it's a great space. So in the new building, it had to be something different. It couldn't be the same. But the, the new building, I think, has a bigger social condenser space. And in a certain sense, that diagonal movement um, through the campus is, is, is super important too, that, that you can walk in one door and come out the other door and not be from the School of Art. You're just passing through. So I, they're very, they're very uh, related in terms of their social mission, but they're very different in terms of the, of the vocabulary, planar and, and volumetric, and I think that, and then concrete and steel, that contrast. We just need the third building to do the linear, that's all. <laughs> Rod, you must have a little pavilion, a little, a little cafe or something that we can do in lines. And then I could say, you know, I'll send everybody here. Lines, planes, and volumes. There it is. It's, you got to go to Iowa, but there it is. 
No, it's oh, okay. three's three's fine. <laughs> Start sketchy. <laughs> I love Gordon Mata Clark. Uh, I, I think, I think he, you know, Gordon Mata Clark studied as an architect at Cornell, and he was a real rebel. You know, what was that word you were using? Irreverence. Irreverence, for sure. Gordon Mata Clark, when he came out of Cornell, came back to the Institute of Architecture and Urban Studies. Do you know? Uh, that was a very famous place that was going on in New York. And when I first arrived in New York, 1977, 78, 79, it was at 8 West 40th Street in a, in a Raymond Hood building. And they had the top two floors. And it was Peter Eisenman and Kenneth Frampton. And they would invite people to do exhibits, right? And uh, they had Michael Grays, Richard Meyer. And they invited Gordon Mata Clark and Dennis Oppenheim to, to make an exhibit. And Andrew McNair was the curator at the time. And those two guys came in, you know, he, they were very, let's say, rebellious about architecture. And they came in and shot all the windows out of the space in the middle of the night. So Andrew had to cancel the opening and put plywood over the windows. And that, that Gordon Mata Clark was an amazing rebel, you know. Um, a lot of very interesting work on, on, on Clark. Next. Chris, can you answer that? <laughs> yeah. it, you know. So when I make a watercolor, I don't think about those things. <laughs> Chris? <laughs> the answer is no. It doesn't increase because, first of all, the, the overall volume is a square volume, super compact. So the carving, uh, in the end, it's not that much area for the area that's enclosed. But also, that glass is super insulated, you know, that translucent that's made out of two glass planks that are structural with translucent insulation between it. And that's what gives it that kind of shoji screen quality is actually insulation. So that's super efficient even though the light's coming in. That's the beauty today. You can bring light in. And by the way, all that light means you don't have the electric lights on. So it's, the building is super energy efficient. That heating and cooling of, through the slabs, the green roof, insulation, the light, uh, the way we hooked into the central plant in a way that actually gives energy back to the <coughs> central plant loop. This building is super advanced ecologically. And we didn't speak much about that, but that's a goal for us right. in all our work. And, and um, in this case, very much so. One more. Yes. Um, in the 1990s, architecture was greatly informed by theory, uh, much of it drawn from other disciplines. So my question is, what do you think of the role, the proper role of theory should be now in the beginning of the 21st century? I think theory is very important. I mean, I, I wrote a book with Ioanni Palazma called uh, Questions of Perception uh, pheno Towards a Phenomenology of Architecture. And I believe that architecture is something that you experience very deeply. So you, you really have to, let's say, have a position which is about the body moving through space, about texture, about light, about the spatial uh, overlap. And what's really curious is now with this architecture activating the brain lecture, it connects back again to those thoughts because that's what Eric Kandel is talking about. You know, that, that, that there's neurological uh, evidence now that these, these aspects of space, light, and experience really are key and they're, they're, they're aspects of our, our emotional existence. And I think I, I, in that talk, I said, uh, there's a famous statement by Winston Churchill. First, we shape our buildings, and then they shape us. And today, we're getting neurological, biological evidence that that is a truth. So I think I will end with that Winston Churchill statement. Thank you. Thank you.